Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. You guys, welcome to the show. I could not be more glad that you are here because we're kicking off a brand new series right now called For the Love of Faith Shakers. So we have done some kick-ass faith series in the past um, in a variety of ways. We've we've had a mix of um, traditional uh, evangelical type leaders like Beth Moore and Max Licato, you know, kind of the people that I grew up listening to and admiring when I was deep in e- the evangelical space. Um, and then we expanded that list for our second faith series to include others doing important work um, toward changing the culture of faith to be inclusive and welcoming and educated, like like Bishop Curry, like Lisa Sharon Harper, um, people who were really on the um, working hard on the margins of justice, right? Um, so we knew as a podcast team, we wanted to return to a faith series. Uh, this community, you, <laughs> you tell us every time we do a faith series, it uh, it tracks hard with this community. This is something you're interested in. It's something um, that you want to hear. You want to hear these leaders and. Um, but we wanted this, this series to be a little different. So we wanted to talk to some people advocating for faith in ways that are really shaking up the culture, both inside the church, but most decidedly out of it as well, like out in the zeitgeist, like out in the, in the wild, out in the wilderness. Um, so they're interested in being in spaces that aren't typically inhabited by people of faith largely, or if they are, it's, it's sort of the, um, the faith people kind of that live on the edges, right on the margins. Um, and so they are, they are living their faith out in non-traditional spaces and places with non-traditional people. Um, and they're, they're bringing God in all the places that they are walking with incredible faithfulness um, and courage to um, be living this out in a non-mainstream place and way. Um, Essentially going by this North Star that God is indeed love. That's kind of the through line on all of our guests. And so I want to tell you just real quickly as a preview, some of the guests that we have in this series. And I mean, this is an incredible lineup of leaders and thinkers. So we've got Cole Arthur Riley. Um, she does Black Liturgists. She's discussing the tradition of liturgy and lament. Morgan Harper Nichols, who's got, she's in space of like language and poetry and art. Um, Lisa Schultz dives into how religion plays a role in politics. Uh, Heather Thompson Day talks about how to guide young people in their faith and beyond, particularly in the realm of social media. That one is fire. Um, Wait till you hear Christina Cleveland, who shatters this outdated image like of just Jesus as a white man, right? Like she's this powerful black woman in her faith. That interview is bananas. Um, Y'all, absolute queen, Krista Tippett will take us to the intersection of spiritual inquiry and social healing and science and culture. Like this is where we're going. Okay. Um, we, and more, these are smart, intelligent, interesting, faithful people who are shaking it up. Right. And so our first guest to kick this series off is one that I have known for quite a while. Um, and we've been on separate but similar journeys where we had to kind of reckon with who we are as people, as leaders, as people of influence and how that relates to our faith, um, both the faith that we grew up with and the faith that has been tested by life and experiences and sorrow and joy. And so even though our journeys have been separate, our paths have crossed in some very significant ways, which we talk about in this interview, you guys, this whole interview is so tender and so, um, transparent. I, I expected 
him to be, but I, I wasn't prepared for how um, genuine and sincere and authentic and vulnerable he was going to be with his story. Um, because we have today um, my friend and journalist, Jonathan Merritt, with us today. And so let me tell you about Jonathan first, and then I want to tell you briefly about our intersections, which he and I talk about at length. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Jonathan, he's a super popular like faith and culture writer. He's smart, 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 smart. He's got a master's of divinity from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's got a master of theology from Emory's um, University's Candler School of Theology. He's done additional graduate work um, at the General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church. He's the recipient of so many awards and accolades, like including the Wilbur Award for Excellence in Journalism and the Religion News Association's Columnist of the Year Award, which is a big one. Also important to this conversation, he grew up in a pretty strict evangelical household and identifies as part of the LGBTQ community. So gay and church, we're going to talk so much about that. Um, and his family was incredibly prominent in Southern Baptist culture. So there's a lot there. If you don't subscribe to his newsletter, I can't recommend it enough. It's called the Faith and Culture Five. And he has this wonderful way of pulling out what's happening in the faith community and then how it's being reported in the world so that we can see how um, Christians are showing up in ways that are good and sometimes in ways that are harmful. Um, he is bright. He is insightful. His the Some of the, the analysis that he lays down in this interview about the status of the church and evangelical subculture and his predictions for its future are so salient, um, so smart. This is such a good interview. Um, I'm really proud of him. I'm proud of, of how far he has come and what he has um, been transparent and honest about in a public space, which is complicated. And that brings me back to our intersection, mine and Jonathan's. I don't know how long you've been around me, but a lot of you will remember that in 2016, about a week before the election, an article came out with me. I was the subject of the interview. And it was in that interview that I said for the first time, I and not only do I believe in and support gay marriage, but I believe in and support gay people. And that I think they're made beautifully. I think there's not one thing wrong with them. I think this is how they are created. They're deserving of love and honor and leadership in the church and to be fully human. And I would perform their weddings and I would drink champagne. I mean, I went all in. And I won't steal its thunder, but that was the end of an era for me. That was the end of my sense of or my, my belonging in that community. It was over overnight. It all dried up. I was, I was, I was canceled as they say now. Um, so I tell you that because Jonathan was the interviewer. Um, he was the one on the other side of the phone asking me these hard questions and kind of breaking the story. And so we talk a lot about what that was like for me. And I asked him, what was this like for you? Um, and they, I think we kind of had a really powerful exchange around this. And so um, I, I so appreciate him today and you're going to as well. And so I think you're going to find this sincere. I think you're going to find it hopeful, um, generous in spirit. And I'm, I'm delighted to bring this conversation to you. So please enjoy the very first guest in this new series, my friend, Jonathan Merritt. Well, I'm so happy to see you and um, you look fantastic. Thanks for being on the show today. You know, I just so appreciate your time and I so appreciate your candor and, you know, your kind of constant willingness to kind of be at all, be out on the razor's edge of everything. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I started my career really picking fights and um, <laughs> if you ask my mother, she'll say that that was something that always came naturally to me. Um, On brand. I do a, little, a little less these days than yeah. I used to because I've grown up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate you saying that because I, I think some of the fights that I've picked have been righteous fights and those are sure. different. Um, yeah, those are, you know, I pick them too. Yeah. So oh, I know. I yeah. know. 
Yeah, I pick I pick my battles, and when I pick them, I pick them hard. Right. So, <laughs> okay, listen, I've told my listeners a little bit about you already as sort of your credentials and high leveled for them who you are, but would you mind quickly before we sort of start talking about everything we're going to talk about, um, uh, for anybody who's new to you, can you tell us a little bit about you and where you are, what your basic deal is, um, and sort of what your, what your work kind of looks like in general? Okay. Yeah. So for, I don't know, the last 15 or so years, I've basically been a writer who sits at the, the intersection of faith and culture. And so columnist, author, ghost written a ton. Um, but I think in, in particularly in the pandemic, my work has shifted a bit uh, away from some of that public facing work to, I, I had a woman, and, and I don't know if this is weird for anyone who, who gave me a word um, right before the pandemic. And she said, you know, I think you're called not just to be a writer, but to be a midwife of ideas. Mm, wow. And so it, when she said that, you know, it was like tuning a guitar string. It really was mm. just like, wow, this is, this resonates with my spirit. And so I began to do other kinds of work developing creative projects in this space as, you know, a literary agent, as, yeah. as kind of a, uh, now moving into some projects in the entertainment space, which is not mm. what I expected to be. So these things are taking shape and, and I still do right. Um, <laughs> but I also get to help other projects live that, that I could never write, that I'm not qualified mm. to write, life experiences that I haven't had, but they're, they are ideas that deserve to exist just mm-hmm. in public. And mm-hmm. so that, that's, that's been a shift for me, but I'm also working on another book. So I'm doing both, but I think the knobs, I've, I've turned the knobs on, on those a little bit, if, if that makes sense. I love that. I, I think that must be really energizing for you. I, you're, you're already, you know, you're obviously a creative and a creator, but it's a different gear to help someone else create. Um, and it's, there's, it's fulfilling in its own way, but completely different muscle to exercise. I just, I love that you're doing that. I think there's um, so much ahead of both of us as creators and what that could look like could take all kinds of forms. Can you just sort of also, cause we were just talking about it before we started recording, um, just talk a little bit about your very dreamy living life, your living space, where you live, yeah. what it's like, you know, my envy is all the way to my bones, to yes. my bones, to my bone marrow. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I know, I know on your podcast, one of the things that you ask your guests is that famous uh, Barbara Brown Taylor yeah, question. Yeah, that's right. You're going to get it. And uh, this is, it's the answer for me mm. uh, to that question. Um, what is saving my life is my chosen family. Yeah. Um, you know, I live in New York City. I live in Manhattan. And it's not always a place where you find the kind of um, home or family or community in the way that other people use those words, because right. this is a transient city and your, your, your friend group will turn over every three or four years. Um, and that's just the way it is. And so I think that the heart and the mind then uh, sort of naturally protects and you begin to form shallow relationships. Yeah. And, um, and that's not what I have here. I live mm-hmm. on the campus of the General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been around for hundreds of years here in Chelsea. Um, in fact, the building next to me was where um, Twas the Night Before Christmas was pinned in front of a mm-hmm. fireplace. And I live in a beautiful building that was built in 1904 mm-hmm. on this lawn. And I'm surrounded by people who I've known for years and years, yeah. and I am an uncle to their children. And we celebrate holidays together and we watch football games and we do book clubs and we ask hard questions and we cry a yeah. lot, a lot. We get to yeah. cry a lot with each other and grieve and celebrate. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I- I'm not partnered, mm-hmm. I don't have children. 
Um, I live very far away from my, my biological nephews and nieces. And so this is a gift. I mean, I said this to a mutual friend of ours who was visiting a, a week or two ago. I said, I am very aware that I am living some of the best days of my life right mm. here, right now with these people. Oh, I love this so much. And I mean, I can absolutely bear witness that you are not exaggerating. The place that you live is magical and charming. And when I'm out in that courtyard, I just think this is it. Like this is gorgeous. And of course you, and I know your community, a lot of my friends are, of course, are, we have the same friends and I love this for you. Like I absolutely love it for you. I don't know what the lifespan is of getting to live at a seminary, but while you are there, may every Friday night be like, pizza night and bring what you have and dips and let's sit on a blanket and let the kids run around. It's absolute magic. Okay. All right. So you like me and like a, actually a a lot of my listening community, we grew up in a a pretty conservative religious environment. This is of course, you know, something you and I've talked about ad nauseum and, but we both deeply understand Um, and as you've said, um, you know, you are, you identify as part of the LGBTQ community. And so can you both remember and talk about, um, or if there was like a point in your life where you realize, and maybe this was a slow burn, I'd like to hear you talk about it, but when, what you wanted for your own life, like who you are and how you are was not available to you in your, in your faith space, in the environment that you were in. And so I want to hear that, how that felt internally. I'm I'm just going to assume it was so lonely and probably terrifying, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Um, And then I'd like to hear after that, how you managed to stay all this time, like to this day, deeply connected, like to your faith. Um, even though it was such a a lonely and an inhospitable place for you during some of your most formative years. Mm -hmm. So you asked a a really a good question. I mean, just a a really great question about a point in my life when I realized, I think your phrase was that what I wanted for my life wasn't available to me. And if you've grown up gay and evangelical, Mm -hmm. um, that is your origin story. That's right. And I grew up in the home of a megachurch pastor who had a PhD in New Testament, who was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He was a TBN, is a TBN televangelist, and described himself uh, gleefully uh, being to the right of Ronald Reagan. And I grew up- (laughs) Jonathan, I hadn't heard that. Oh gosh. I grew up reading Ann Coulter mm-hmm. books and, uh, yeah. be, you know, um, defending a seven day literal creationism sure. and believing that people who, um, who, who were attracted to people of their same gender were disordered and abominations. And that meant mm-hmm. me. And yeah. when you hear these, these sort of disgusting things that, that um, the ignorant things that are said by evangelicals um, about gay, lesbian, transgender people, mm-hmm. non-binary people, anyone that doesn't fit into uh, that box, right. anybody can realize the, that that is painful for someone like me. Mm-hmm. It's another thing when it, it is out of the mouth of the people that you you want with your whole heart to love you and accept you. And yes. um, and so that was for me, I lived so wanting to be loved and accepted by my parents and my community, because who doesn't want belonging? Of course. And um, and so that meant that I had to choose. I had a choice. Uh, I could either. Leave the idea of being loved. In, in that way and loving in that way behind and, yeah. and to get belonging and acceptance, or I could choose to be rejected by yeah. the people that I was given as a family and, a, and a, a faith community. And I could sort of go off on my own way and try to find love. And that's a tough, that's a tough decision. Oh gosh. Um, so for the first 29 years of my life, that's mm-hmm. how I lived. Yeah. 
And then uh, a week or two before my 30th birthday, the capital U universe uh, pushed me off the cliff. And yeah. that's when I was outed in a very public way. Um, Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, you know, I, I had um, written an article in USA Today, a column, and it was called um, An Evangelical's Plea, um, uh, Love the Center. Yeah. Which is a prescient article now looking back, hmm. um, because what I was really saying was love me. Of course. And I, I was arguing in there that, you know, I had grown up hearing this, we hate the sin, we love the sinner. And, and yet everywhere I looked was all this sin hate. Mm. And there was not a lot of, uh, there was no uh, markings of loving these That's people right. who they believed were, I should qualify that, believed were sinners, right. so to yeah. speak. And uh, a gay blogger uh, reached out to me after that, who said he appreciated this uh, article. We formed a friendship. I began to, to, to give this person my trust. I began to mm -hmm. share things with this person that I had never shared before. And on one occasion I was in, um, I was actually speaking at the Q conference in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Person lived in Indiana and said, I'd love to come down and meet you. And I mm -hmm. said, great. We had dinner, we had drinks, too many of them. We made out, mm -hmm. we didn't have sex. He, they didn't, this person didn't stay in my, my, my hotel room. Mm -hmm. And when I came home, I was completely disoriented. So this for me was like a real life shattering event. Sure. Uh, and so when I came home, this person was like, wanted to be in a relationship with me. Right. And I, I was not ready for that. I couldn't mm -hmm. get my head around what had just happened. And so I had to sever that relationship. Uh -huh. Three years later, I wrote another article for the Atlantic in the midst of the Chick-fil-A uproar yeah. that was called In Defense of Eating Chick-fil-A that went yeah. viral at the time. And as I said in that article, it had nothing to do with gay marriage. It was an argument about intertwining our politics and mm. our consumerism in a capitalistic culture and why that's mm -hmm. unsustainable. I still believe this. It's yeah. not a, I believe this today as, as progressive as I am, but that person um, then decided to share publicly um, what had happened mm -hmm. um, because he interpreted that article to be, to be anti-gay. Um, ah, I see. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I then entered into, for me, you know, change, change happens. It's both a rupture and it's a process. Yeah. And so that was a rupture. And at that point, then I wasn't even sure who I was or what I was. Uh -huh. So, so, you know, I, I, it sent me on a journey that is, that was multi years after that, where this, am I gay thing was just what a psychologist would call a presenting problem. Hmm. Um, but when you peeled back that there were all of these unhealed yeah. sutured wounds that had to be attended to. Mm. Um, and they had festered for a long, long time. Totally. And so uh, that for me was the single event in my life. It is an, it is BC and AD. Yeah. Uh, it was, it that event was like yeah. a hammer that shattered my life into two pieces. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I both grieve it and would never wish it on anyone. And uh -huh. in another way, I'm so grateful for that. I understand this. It really made me do some things. It, it forced some things that should have happened earlier and thank God didn't happen later. Um, mm. And so it, it's a messy, terrible, wonderful thing that I, that I went through. Mm, I understand that so much. Um, I, can, I can imagine um, when all those top layers get peeled back um, that the, I'm guessing what was underneath there having really been buried for you had a lot to do with your family. Can you talk about what that was like? Because this is a big deal when another person puts your, like the tenderest part of not just your story, but like your identity out in a public place and you've got parents and you have aunts and uncles and like it, it it's so intrusive into the privacy of your actual lived life. And I'm wondering if that's where you had to kind of ultimately start once you manage the sort of social chaos of being thrust into the, the spotlight like that. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, and and as you know, in these situations, there's also professional implications. Suddenly, Absolutely. I wasn't I wasn't sure that I'd be able to pay rent. Yeah. Um, and and that is a, a hell of an experience. I mean, people who have. I mean, you were writing for RNS, so yeah. So we, I I would say with my parents that for me, people have said like, well, why in in the last ten years did you not talk a lot about this in public? And the reason is is because I was just having to first talk about it so much in private. Hmm. And to really try to, to triage this by dealing with family and friends first. And unfortunately, in my case, um, for many years, I was up against denial. Yeah. Um, a, a real lack of acceptance yeah. uh, on, on the part of my family and friends. Uh-huh. And, um, and it took years hmm. to have conversations that, you know, other people, people probably have with their friends and family in a matter of mm-hmm. days. And, yeah. um, and so, and there was also a changing conception of who I was. So every time we talked, it's like, I thought you said this and now you're saying this and now you're saying this. Mm-hmm. And so it, it was messy for all of us. Um, but I think for me, it really had, it, it really centered on working through first with my mom mm-hmm. who, who had all these dreams for her boy that had to die and be grieved. And for my dad, who has all of these beliefs about what is good and not good and how those things play into whether or not I will be present in his conception of the afterlife. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that is a, that's a scrambled egg Mm, and it's hard, it's hard to pull all of that apart. So I understand that people, many people in my own community who felt frustrated in that Mm -hmm. time that I wasn't inviting them in, in a more public way Mm -hmm. into that process, but it was, it was a full-time job to manage it on the back end. And it was all I could do. Mm. When more or less, when did that break? And how far back was this? I want to put it in the timeline here. So in 2012, I went to see, uh, I started seeing a therapist pretty intensively and they were really opening me up and, and helping me clean out some of the mess, which, you know, that went on for a good year. And then I, I made the move from Atlanta, where I was living yeah. as a teaching pastor, essentially yeah. under my dad, yeah. at a Southern Baptist church, making the move then um, to New York City, hmm. again, continuing this counseling journey, therapy, self-exploration, mm-hmm. dating, yeah. And that went on for, for probably another five years. Yeah. Um, and it, it wasn't really, I'd say until late last year mm. um, that the dam broke. And I finally had to have some real conversations with, with some people who are very close to me to say, mm. it, it, it is clear now that you do not know me very well. Yeah. And I would like you to do that. And so in order to do mm. that, these are the things that we will need to do. And I was gifted with parents who in that moment were willing to step into that and with siblings yeah. who were willing to step into that. Yeah. And through that, we've developed probably a, a, a kind of relationship that is boundaried and also healthy sure. that is that I didn't think was possible. Mm. I love to hear that. Um, you know, I've watched the way that you have spoken both to and about your dad, particularly, you know, he's such a, he's, he's, he's run up the SBC flagpole all the way to the tip top. Um, and the way that you have interacted with him and, and spoken even of him publicly has always been wildly generous, so respectful, connected, as connected as you could probably be at the time. Um, and I always really admired that. And I remember watching you sort of do this public lift, which is so complex. I mean, there's so much in that soup pot that you are trying to figure out. Um, I just remember thinking, mm, Jonathan is going to be proud later yeah. of the way he did this, of the way that he spoke to and about his family, his parents, um, of what you shared and didn't share publicly at the pace in which 
you pulled back the curtain on your own life and you gave your private life a chance to be private because there is a difference between privacy and secrecy. Um, and we are, we are allowed privacy. That is our right. And um, just knowing, I, I was assuming this for you will continue to roll out. You will continue to develop into your own identity. You will continue to like grow into your own confidence and faith and sexuality and ultimately probably relationships. Like that's going to keep happening because it just happens to all of us. But in the, in the sort of murky beginning-ish, middle-ish, while that was still in flux, um, I, 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 I'm proud of the way that you didn't burn all the ships, um, that you, you kept possibility open for repair and for reconnection. And like, even last year, being able to say, we got to go 10 layers deeper than we are right now. This is, we've gone, this is, I need more. And I think because of the way that you've treated your family and your friends who were in conflict all this time, that was possible. That was really possible. I hope that you feel proud of yourself when you look back on this last decade. Yeah, I, I, I do, I do, I do feel proud, but I also appreciate you saying that because, you know, the one thing that you can never do is observe your life from the outside. And this has also been a decade with so many mistakes, Hmm. so many mistakes and um, people who were hurt along the way. And um, I, have, I also grieve that. So I, I'm, I, I am in that tension of, of grief and celebration for the last year. Yeah. Um, and, and I also realize that if it took me 29 years to even begin this conversation, that mm-hmm. it's okay if it takes some yeah. other people a little bit of time too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. I, and I give them, I give them that grace, but I will say it is an ongoing process. And there are some okay. days where it is really, really hard. Yeah. Um, but we, we fight with each other and for each other. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and that's how we do family. Yeah. Um, but you know, there, there, you can find any armchair expert online that will tell you to cut your family off and all of this. And of yeah. course, now with a lot of the thinking that's being done around, you know, internal family systems theory, the idea is that like, when you cut off those prime primary relationships, you've integrated parts of those people into yourself. And those parts need to be healed, but you cannot heal within unless you do the work of healing between. And so Mm -hmm. if it's possible to do that hard, holy work, then you should do it if you can. Not everybody can. And I I have up to this point been able to do that. And what I have seen is it's not only healed that liminal space between me and my dad and me and my mom and me and some of these friends, but all of those, those yeah. parts inside of me that I've inherited from them, they've also been able to be put back together mm. and, and to be healed. And so, you know, it's not just about the relationship with That's someone right. else. It's about my internal world and the, th- and the pieces there that need to be put back together. That's pretty profound. Um, I've got a good friend working through that sort of approach to like relational mental health. Will you just name it one more time for people who are like, what did he say? Yeah. Oh, like in internal yeah. family systems theory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the idea is like, there's a piece of your mom. Everybody will see this. Oh, I'm just like my mom in that way. You know, you can realize you've integrated parts of their personalities, uh-huh. their frameworks, their assumptions. And that's just what happens in, uh, to children. And so it's not like drawing a boundary with a neighbor, you know, because you, you right. haven't integrated your neighbor into yourself. But in your immediate family, there are all these pieces. So when you cut off those immediate family members, and sometimes it's necessary, unfortunately, you cut off the possibility of certain kinds of healing that you desperately need. You actually believe you're protecting yourself. And there's a positive feedback loop because you do get temporary relief. But what you don't get is the ultimate healing. You cut yourself off from the thing you actually need. And, um, and I, I have been able to keep that door open. There have been months where we haven't been able to speak sure. in the past and we just had to have boundaries like that. We're not in that place now. And I'm yeah. really grateful for that, but that's, it's, it's this internal family systems thinking that it, it's, it's new and it's emerging and, and things are, are, are being written about it now. But if people are, I think I've got a book called like no bad parts. 
Mm. And um, uh, maybe it's Richard Schwartz, I think. Um, but it's a great book uh, that, that inside you, there are all these things and they're not bad parts, they're reflections of the brokenness that you've inherited. Well, Jonathan has been talking about the power of belonging and acceptance or their lack and the impact of rejection. And these are big things and can be messy and confusing and isolating and so difficult to work through. And ones where therapy can really come in alongside to help. So obviously better help is professional online therapy. It's all done through a virtual platform. Your therapist literally meets you right where you are. So whether you've done therapy before or not, I really appreciate what BetterHelp is offering because it's so approachable and accessible. They prioritize matching you with the right licensed therapist for your story. And they do so with this questionnaire that works to identify specific points of suffering and really sticky areas that are burdened to you. You can always request a new counselor at any time with no additional charge if you feel like it's not a match. BetterHelp is not only convenient, it's also affordable. Plus, there's no waiting time. You can start talking with a BetterHelp therapist in under 24 hours. So as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Join more than a million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. What is it about cereal that's like the ultimate comfort food, right? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, midnight, anytime. But those fun cereals, you know the ones. I mean, they're very rarely winning points in the wholesome nourishing category. But I have actually recently discovered a cereal that is a much healthier option. It's called Catalina Crunch. And it's, okay, it's zero sugar. It's keto friendly, it's low carb, but it is still so good. It does not taste like cardboard. And Catalina Crunch's flavors are nostalgic. Like you can get cinnamon toast, fruity, honey graham varieties. They also have options that are like dessert in a box, right? Like dark chocolate and mint chocolate chip and chocolate peanut butter. Catalina Crunch uses real ingredients and is gluten-free and grain-free. Plus they pack in 11 grams of plant-based protein and nine grams of fiber for every serving. I know it seems too good to be true, but it is a real thing. So see why Catalina Crunch cereal is the, literally the fastest growing cereal brand in America. Just go to catalinacrunch.com slash for the love for 15% off your first order plus free shipping. So that's catalinacrunch.com slash for the love. If you're not sure which flavor to start with, try variety pack and check out their delicious cookies and snack mixes while you're at it. So again, it's catalinacrunch.com slash for the love for 15% off your first order plus free shipping. I alluded to this in my introduction, um, but you and I have been down parallel paths in the evolution of our faith, um, really even tightly wound together, frankly. And, you know, obviously there's you coming into your own as identifying as a gay man of faith. And then there was me in the same zip code rec reckoning with my views, my theology, my doctrine. Um, this is all as like gay marriage is becoming legal. And, um, and of course, my own daughter, Sydney's um, identification in the LBGTQ community. Um, and there was a very intense examination of my heart, um, my, my ideology, my thoughts toward the whole thing, because I come to this uh, crossroads for me where my head and my heart were at such odds around this, which is kind of rare for me, to be honest with you. Like generally these guys are in lockstep when it comes to matters of faith, most faith, uh, most faith things for me make sense. They make sense because they bear out truthfully. Um, I get the concept of forgiveness. I watch it bear out. Like I get the concept of being a good neighbor. I watch it bear out, but the concept of the LGBTQ community being malformed or um, I, I, nothing made sense. I could not get this to reconcile because um, all I saw on the other side of that doctrine, of course, was death, destruction, heartache, suffering, um, self-harm, the suicide rates. I mean, we all know this. 
Um, and so it wasn't matching. It wasn't matching. The thing wasn't doing the thing it said it was going to do. And so you know that, and you had watched me sort of grapple with this publicly in a certain way, in a way that was circling the drain, um, but still holding some doors open, right? Um, just for conversation to keep going. So in a blaze of glory, um, I laid down my change of mind and my change of heart and my change of theology um, in an interview with you. Um, now, most of my community will remember this article. They may not know that you were the guy, that you were the one on the other end of the phone. Um, and as we both know, it was met with, it was wild. It was one of the wildest seasons of my life. Um, just, uh, I don't even know if we were saying the word cancel culture that year. This was in 2016. And in a in a in just an absolute move of bananas timing, it was a week before the election. I mean, I was just going down in flames everywhere. You know, I've been so vocally anti-Trump. Um, and, um, you know, I lost a huge portion of my community overnight. And as you mentioned earlier, an enormous professional um, effect as well, that uh, there was just a whole part of my work that was over. It wasn't up for debate. It wasn't up for let's sit down and talk about this. It was just over. My books were pulled off shelves. One of them was put out of print um, and I got called a heretic by every person that lived on earth. And so it was a, such a disruptive time and it was scary. I don't think we're built for that level of attention period, be it good or bad. And then just that level of just vitriol. And, um, but it's, it's like you said earlier, like, I, I wish that on no one, absolutely no one to stand at the center of that storm and not let it kill you. But I am not sorry it happened. Like, there was no more circling the drain. It was it that that did it that that pushed me publicly into where I already was, obviously. I mean, I told you the bald truth about how I felt about um, not just gay marriage, but how I felt about gay people that I think they're beloved by God and there's nothing wrong with them and they deserve love and happiness and marriage and all toast champagne at their weddings. I believe is what I told you. Um, you know what me, I'm going to go in. If you're going to ask me, I'm going to be extra about it. Um, and so I want to talk to you about your memory of that time, particularly with you and I, and cause you were in an interesting space. You're a journalist primarily writing through, so some of the just more controversial um, elements of faith and doctrine, that being a key, um, a key one. Um, and then you, you're in a unique position to begin to, well, genuinely, like through your work, begin to sort of build a community of voices um, from the faith community to say, there's another way. Um, we don't, subscribe to this thing. That's just kind of the leading ideology. Um, this is not, okay. this is not okay. Um, what we're doing, how we are going to re-examine this doctrine through a variety of different lenses. And you sort of started building this, um, this space. So can you talk about what that was like for you and what you were hoping to accomplish and kind of uh, I, I know how that went for me. I'm curious how it went for you. Well, that was a that, very long, I don't even know if that was a question. Yeah, that was I a monologue. Exactly, I, I know exactly what you're uh -huh. asking. And I think this is fascinating because we've never had this conversation actually mm -hmm. having been friends. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that during that period, because I felt like I, I was having to do so much private work around this, um, maybe, maybe this was my way of, of doing some public work, or maybe that's mm -hmm. how I thought about it. You know, I, I was, I was really impacted years ago by an article in which Ed Stetzer was quoted. And he said, you know, you can take all the evangelicals who are, who are pro-gay and fit them in a minivan. I, I remember this. Mm -hmm. And that didn't, that, that didn't sound right to me. 
And yeah. I was having conversations with people off the record who were telling me very different things. Mm -hmm. And so what I decided was, because I was doing interviews with interesting people who were Christians, that I would just start asking people. Um, and so, you know, I broke the Trey Pearson story and I wrote the story of you and I, and I broke the story about Eugene Peterson's yeah. uh, change of heart and David Gushy and, and, and these yeah. stories. And I will say, I feel conflicted um, hmm. looking back on, on those because th there's a sense in which, look, a, a question is in an interview, it's fair game and somebody can choose to answer or not answer those questions. And also, um, it was a way for me to use other people to have conversations that I was not a part of. I was not allowing myself to be a part of. And, um, and I think in the case, in, both in the case of, uh, of, of your, the article that I did with you, which was about politics and Eugene Peterson, which was around you know, his life, I was shocked at the, I, I knew when I knew in those moments, I was like, okay, this is gonna get clicks. People are gonna yeah. read this. This is gonna be interesting to a lot of people. But I did not expect mm -hmm. that order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, was I was kind of dragged into it, but nobody mm -hmm. was nobody was canceling me. You know, yeah. even evangelicals complain about cancel culture as one of the most weird, uh, <laughs> ironic. Right. I mean, they, they have honed that skill over so many decades yeah. and, uh, and now they're whining about it when it, when yeah. the same mechanisms that they have perpetrated and yeah. perfected are now turned back on them. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't cry to me about that, but, <laughs> right. but I, I, I'll say I was, I was shocked and I, and I, I lost sleep over it too, because mm -hmm. I thought, did I just screw up her life? Mm -hmm. Um, did I just ruin this person's life? Um, and so for me, it was a time I think of really looking inward and, and, and thinking about whether what I was doing was in service to the truth or in service mm -hmm. to myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a mix of both. Um, well, you know what, we're, um, you know, six years out from that article that came, you know, 2016. And I can just tell you, I mean, again, like my metric is always, let's look to the fruit of a thing. Let's see what the fruit tells us. It's pretty uh, trustworthy. Um, um, the fruit's good or it's bad and we'll, it'll bear out. Um, and even though there was a short game there, there was a short term catastrophic effect to me personally, um, just as a, as a leader, as a writer, as a person in evangelical culture at the time, which of course I'm not now, but, um, the long effects of the long effects of that moment are ca categorically good. Like I, I couldn't even. I really couldn't even quantify it, frankly, right. like um, sort of being forced into standing in my own convictions. Um, and so I had the moment there at the beginning, I'm like, I could walk this back a little. I know how to do that. Like we know the rules of the community. We know the words to say, we know how you can be contrite in a certain way with a certain script and find your way kind of back into the thing on probation. Do you know what I mean? I know that I've seen people do that. And so I remember that temptation just because it was so wild. I was like you, I expected it, of course, but I didn't expect what happened, but I just thought, no, I'm going to stand in it. I'm going to stand in the storm until it passes. And then I'm free. And I was, and then I was free to be an absolute, like transparent, all the way, 100% ally. And the amount of, uh, there's no, there, it's bottomless how many LGBTQ people, moms and dads of gay kids, sisters, brothers, pastors, there's no end to how much they have reached out and just said, this set us free to reexamine. Yeah. Um, we just, we needed somebody from the inside to change her mind. Yeah. 
Like it's one thing I used to tell Rachel, um, held Evans to everybody listening. I used to tell Rachel, why aren't they mean to you? Like, why do you get a free pass? Why do you get to be affirming in your theology and you just still get to like live your life? She's like, because, um, the evangelical subculture has room for you. If that's how they meet you, they meet you in a certain place. You're progressive. This is your theology and your ideology. They do not have room. If you change your mind, yeah. changing your mind is a different category. That's right. Um, and so I feel like I changed my mind in public. I think it has had an incredible positive effect and I don't regret it at all. So you shouldn't either. Let's, let's regret things that require regretting. Okay. We've got plenty of that too. Yeah. We've been garbage people. Like yeah. let's not regret things that shouldn't be regretted. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You used your space too, in a way that meant a lot to people like whose backs do we have, right? Are we trying to keep the power players happy and in charge? Or are we siding with people who have been marginalized and wounded and have suffered at the hand? That's where we go. That's right. where we go. This is not ambiguous. Right. So there's my two cents on it. Let me ask you this, because it's, you have really been in the deal. Like you have been in it, like as a journalist, you have reported on it. You've got your, your finger on the pulse of trends and what's changing and what's shifting. And you're always paying attention. I'd like to know what you think right now about our faith in this culture. What do you, do you feel hopeful? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? And not just about the LGBTQ community and their full and rightful place inside the church, obviously, but um, all of it, the, 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 the Trump era, the, 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 the continued marriage of um, this, the evangelical culture to a, to a political party. Um, do you see it shifting? Do you see it changing? Do you see it I just don't know. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I, you know, I wrote a book in 2012 about the evangelical political situation. Uh, It was called A Faith of Our Own, Following Jesus Beyond the Culture Wars. And I essentially said, this is where this is heading. And nobody at the time, everybody's like, no, it's not. Like, this is Mm. principled. It's not about power. It's about um, uh, character uh, of our leaders and morals. And so nobody bought it, which, which <laughs> is, you know, is, is what it is. <laughs> the um, end. And, yeah. And that's so the story of like, publishing. Exactly. So then people will be like, over these last few years, like, are you surprised at what mm. you've seen with Donald Trump? And the answer is, I think it's the logical end of decisions that were made in the 1970s, essentially, mm. in reaction to the cultural revolutions that were happening. And uh, the rise of feminism, the rise mm-hmm. of the gay rights movement, the Stonewall riots, you know, triggered that, the, the separation of church and yeah. state in, in public schools, legalization of um, uh, birth control and abortion yeah. and um, the civil rights movement. Yeah. And white folks didn't like that. White Christian folks, particularly in the South, didn't like that so much. Yeah. And so they decided they would become a political force. And it's been very effective. But it is always politics for evangelicals have always been a means to an end. And the end is dominance and control. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think there is an unmasking that is happening. And I think that, you know, evangelicals had in the 90s, there was this storyline that all the liberal main lines were declining because they were liberal and liberalism ends in death. Right, right. right. Now we have uh, demographers and we go, oh no, it was just because of birth rates. You guys were just having lots of babies. Mm -hmm. And now your birth rates have also slowed down and you've turned out to be really nasty bigots. And so (laughs) your churches are also dying. And so if you look, for example, at the Southern Baptist Convention, it's the largest Protestant body in America. It's going down, down, down unambiguously yeah right but now now it's not a theological thing now oh. you, they go it, for them it's not like well this must also be a reflection on our theology mm-hmm. it's just move the goalpost and keep marching and yeah. so I, I think that there is a holy judgment that is falling right now um, mm-hmm. on the on the evangelical movement and there are some good people who are still a part of it i'm not you're not 
Yeah. Uh, there are some good people who are still a part of it. There yeah. are the dissenters who are mm-hmm. trying to save evangelicalism from itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that that is a, a futile task. I, I don't Do think you? that. I don't think that evangelicalism will vanish from the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, the model is too attractive. Mm. Uh, people want certainty. They like sure. rules. I used to, um, you know, that used to be a comfort. It, it's a big thing for a lot of people. And so I think the model is to some degree too attractive. Mm. And uh, so it won't disappear, but it will, uh, it's going to do two things. One, by the nature of the way it's set up, it will fracture because there's yeah. no public there's no hierarchy. It mm-hmm. is a, it is a, it is a, ref, it is a, a brand of Christianity that is uniquely capitalistic, yeah. consumeristic and mm-hmm. individualistic. That's right. Very individualistic, you know, yeah. all rise of non-denominationalism. Right. And it's a very American way of being. It's yeah. why evangelicalisms in other Western countries like the UK are nothing now. Right. It's very American. And so I do think it has some staying power but it's, it's in the midst of an identity crisis. It doesn't know what it is. It's in the midst of a fracturing. And I think they have an image problem that in the world of social media, in, the, in, a, in a consumeristic world of brands, their brand could not be more toxic than it is. And I don't see any way that that could be, that that can be renovated, at least not in our lifetimes. I agree with you. I don't think there's, um, I think it's beyond the moment where repair or reform is possible. That yeah. it's past, it's past. That's in the rearview mirror. So um, it will be what it's going to be probably. Um, my guess too, is that it will continue to, I don't this, you know, this word is so loaded. I can't find another one all of a sudden, but become a little bit more radicalized, like more intense, more doubled down, um, not finding any bridges or, you know, any connective tissue anywhere else. It, it'll be so siloed, um, which is again, appealing to some that's right. appealing. The silo effect of being a Christian in this world, it has a, it has some staying power in our culture anyway. And, and modern um, and, and modern even American evangelicalism is predicated on the existence of an enemy to fight. That's right. People and that's a and that keeps people coming to church. Sure. So yeah. it's, a, it's very attractive when 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 it there's this it's the need to be against right. Yes. Um, and people actually revel in that. Um, that's uh-huh. that's a selling point. You know, there was that's an right. article that was written during the Trump era that, based on a study the nastiest parts of Trump actually had the highest polling numbers. That's right. I they remember that he was nasty. They loved that. Uh-huh. He was mean. They loved that. He would make fun of people and call yeah. people names. That's what they do. That's right. That's right. That was so disorienting. I remember when all that data was coming out and it just got, I, I kept scrolling. I'm like, it's getting worse. It's just getting worse. It was, it's just so demoralizing. You know, this is the church that raised us and I, I will, I will, I think I will just remain while I can understand the analytics. I can on its face, understand the human tendencies that are, that have caught this lightning in a bottle in this sort of marriage of a party. And I will, I think I will remain flabbergasted my whole life at how it's played out. I just flabbergasted, uh, shocked and disappointed and sad. I mean, really just sad. I, 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 the way it has sort of escalated in the last five years, it's just in some ways, things I never thought I'd see or hear. I, I'm still like sitting over here going, well, that, no, it's just. And so I think it's interesting to hear you talk about the dissenters from the inside, you probably are a little bit more connected still to that community by virtue of your family, by virtue of your work, um, to know that. I don't know that anymore. I'm so far removed from that subculture. Um, do you feel like those dissenters are getting like chewed up for dinner? Like, do, do we need to send help? Like, do they need to blink twice if they like need us to come get them? Um, 
well, what, what is happening is, is that the institutions that they've built and propped up are now falling in on them. Yes. Um, so, you know, they, they, the weapons have been sort of turned against them and, um, that which a person sows, they will also reap. And, um, I, mean, I, I, I don't think any intervention is, is needed necessarily, but yeah, they are, they're being destroyed because the real yeah. division is between, if you look at, if you look at sort of the sociology of it is between what you would call evangelical, what has been called by a, a, a sociologist named Michael Lindsay, the evangelical populists and the evangelical elites. Hmm. Most of the resistance to the, the kind of Trumpist move yeah. is from scattered elites, hmm. people who like subscribe to Christianity today and they graduated from seminary. Yeah. The regular folks who show up and cast ballots are pretty much in lockstep on this. Hmm. Uh, so it's an untenable position for these yeah. leaders because, you know, you become a king without a country or a queen without a country, yeah. so to speak. You're, you're leading, but nobody's following. Yeah. And, and I think that is the moment that a lot of these people are, are entering, entering into people like Russell Moore. Yeah, I was just thinking about him. Get out of his nomination. People, uh, you know, there are lots of people like this. We yeah. don't have to name them all, but there are lots of people like this. And we have a lot of friends too, I think, good people yeah. that we love who are yep. evangelicals who have also had to kind of wiggle their way out of it. Yep. And they feel called to stay. And I don't wish a pox on their house. I just yeah. am finding God in other places these days. I've talked a lot about mental health. You know this. But did you know that reading can be super supportive of your mental wellness too? Um, like if you've ever gotten lost in a good book, then you know how much of a transporting experience reading can be. But reading has also been proven to reduce stress and anxiety, to increase empathy and social support, and promote respect for and tolerance of other views. So let me tell you about the magical place we've created with the Jen Hatmaker Book Club. It's full of stories. The ones we read, of course, and the ones we share among our private community, which is the single best corner of the internet, truly. And so every month, a beautiful box is magically delivered to your door and inside is an adventure waiting for you. And I know I sound like the biggest nerd here, but this book club truly has been such a radically good thing for me and the women in our community. And I'll tell you this, they're waiting to welcome you with open arms. We always get to hear from the authors themselves every month. They give us their favorite music playlists and more. And you always have an opportunity to ask them directly your pressing questions about their book. This book club is truly one of my favorite things. Come join us. It's at jenhatmakerbookclub.com. I'd love to hear that about you, about where has your, what does your faith look like these days? Um, how are you finding God? What feels true to you? Like what lasted? What stuck? Um, what do, what were you able to say? This is just, this is of man. This isn't of God and walk from and, um, and, and how, how do you feel like you live out your faith right now? Um, having come so far in a decade. Um, you know, I, I have the benefit of, of going to school and, and having studied this. Yeah. And so, you know, growing up, or even when you encounter a lot of these evangelical leaders, they'll argue their position. And it's so, they're, 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 people can be so skilled at weaponizing the text, the scripture. And that doesn't work with me because I go, oh yeah, you know, like that's like actually the minority of the 14 interpretations of that totally. chapter and, and Mark. So like, they get bring out of a my knife to a gunfight with you. I, like, I, like, not that, today, Clarence. Like, you. not today. Thank you. Uh -huh. So for me, it's, it is not, I'm less interested now in just turning back the arguments of, sure. of a community. I, I'm not, I'm not really connected to evangelicalism. Totally. I, I'm still, I mean, I live in an Episcopal seminary. Uh, That's right. You, know, yeah. you can feel hundreds of years of prayers mm -hmm. that have been prayed here by good people. Mm -hmm. That's people lovely. People who joined the civil rights movement and That's right. people who were, were marching after the Stonewall riots and people who did it because mm -hmm. they loved Jesus and not in spite of that fact. And so the thing that gives me life, um, you know, I'm, I'm at my next book, which I'm working on is about, is about sort of trauma informed approaches to the Christian scriptures, to Christian mm. practices. 
And what I am finding is, is that, you know, there's this image in the, te- in the Bible that, uh, it, that in the last days that God will, will transform swords into plowshares. Yeah. I feel like that is my spirituality now that all of these, these tools, practices, stories that for me had such sharp edges mm. and that wounded me so deeply. You know, it's not using, to quote mm. um, Audre Lorde, it's not using the master's tools to defeat the master. It's allowing these tools to transform into the good gifts that they are. Mm. And I am more in love with the Bible than I have ever been. I just don't read it anything like I used to. Sure. Um, it's, but it is for me a living word with all of this ancient archetypal truths about what it means to survive life on planet earth. And so I think that's something even in my family with my dad that challenges them is that I may not have the right answers, but you cannot deny that I am walking this thing out, that I am, that I am living this sort of Jesus informed faith. And so how do you reconcile that? Because this right. is somebody who's supposed to be evil and dark That's right. and left out. Yeah. And yet they're believably Christian. That's right. And I think that challenges, it's that life on life experience that happens mm-hmm. in families when someone turns out different than you thought they would be, where that category, there's no room for that category mm-hmm. in your life. And now it just is. Mm-hmm. That, that, that challenges the whole system. It's why the number one reason that someone changes their views on homosexuality or, or same-sex marriage is how they answer the question. Do you have someone in, in your, yeah. do you have a close family member or friend who is gay? Yeah. Because relationship changes us. And I sure think that's does. the way that, that theology, theology grows. So for me, I'm still rooted in faith. It's just totally different than it used to be. Hmm. I'm telling you what, those Episcopalians, man, like they are the greatest. I love that. That's been a lovely home for you. Mm -hmm. And that it's just a place of such deeply rooted faithfulness. And like you live there, that's in your walls. It's the grass that you walk on. It's profoundly sacred to me that you get to live in such a place where so many faithful people have walked before you um, so many generations. And I love this gift for you and I hope it lasts forever. So Jonathan, Uh, Thank you for your candor today and for being so willing to talk about such tender things and with such frankness, because this is so true and vulnerable in your life. And in addition, so many of the things you talked about are common. Like this is what a lot of people are walking through with their parents and in their churches and in their own hearts and in their own sexual identity. And so anytime I think we're able to put some like love and life and voice and experience around these lonely places. It's powerful and your story matters and people will be moved by it and inspired by it and encouraged by it. And so, uh, you know, again, that's not something you and I'll probably ever get to know it to its fullest, what these kind of conversations mean to real people, but thank you for having it. And thank you for being willing to kind of share out of your own hurt and your own story. I just, it's not going to be without fruit. I just know it. I know it for sure. Can you just tell everybody really quickly? Um, now, number one, you answered my question at the beginning. Do you want to stand by your answer? Do you have anything else to say? Let's say you had to pick a plan B on what's saving your life right now. All right. I'll tell you your second thing. Um, and uh, as my computer is almost dying, so I'm going to Uh just scoot over here and charge Uh it. Um, Uh uh, I'll tell you something that that is also saving my life right now. I, I started about three or four years ago. I, I started spiritual direction, which mm. is a, it's a very specific thing. I meet with a, a Jesuit priest, um, um, Father Jim Martin, and we meet every where well, we try to meet every month. And um, it is such a sweet thing to sit with someone to just ask you how God's showing up in your life. Mm. And then to remind you that they're keeping like track of it. And so they're able to say like, yeah, you know, God doesn't, God is showing up in your life as gratitude and generosity. And, Mm -hmm. you know, 
teaching me something that was not a part of my previous faith tradition, which is trusting my experience. Mm -hmm. I was not taught to trust my experience. I was taught to be skeptical of it. And so trusting that you you're experiencing God in these Mm -hmm. spaces and that you can trace those experiences and, and you begin to, to, to develop um, a more acute sense of what is and isn't God in your life. Mm-hmm. That I will say spiritual direction for me has been a game changer. And mm-hmm. I have wept and wept and mm-hmm. wept in some of those meetings because I grew up with a God who was angry and temperamental. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, and that's important. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, he was not someone that I could, could trust. Yeah. He was not someone that I really uh, felt friendly toward. I was afraid yeah. of, of him. And to, to have that God concept that was such a sword be pounded into mm. a plowshare that is doing good work in my heart, it's been a gift. And that mm. is also saving my life right now. Mm. That's such a great answer. So, yeah. okay. Everybody, where to find you? When's your new book coming out, by the way? Are you I, writing it right this second? I'm writing it right this second. I uh-huh. think, I think I was just corresponding with my publisher yesterday. I think it will be out in January of 2024. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've got to get it in by the end of this year. It also could come out late next year. We'll see. Uh-huh. Um, so, but people can follow me. I do tweet on rare occasion and I love Instagram. I'm that guy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm on Instagram. You people can look me up there or go to my website, Jonathan Merrick. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks for being on today. I'm happy to see you. I'm happy to see you doing so well and flourishing and thriving and just really kind of being you, being the most you I've ever known you to be in your own life. Um, and it's wonderful to watch. And so whatever it cost and took to get here, it's wonderful to see Jonathan. And I'm, I'm proud of you and I'm, I'm happy for you. And I think your leadership matters. And so, um, you know, I come your way all the time and I just work, I bully my way into Chelsea because it's just so darn cute. So next time I'm up there, let's get together. Well, thank you so much, friend. The pleasure has been all mine. Okay, you guys, I know that was a lot to listen to. Thank you for being here. Um, Jonathan is so smart and he's so observant and um, just he's living his life in a way that I respect and I'm proud of. And so uh, this is a good one to share. This is a great one to share with people that you're in um, deep faith conversations with maybe who are kind of grappling with their own ideology or theology around any given number of things or their own place of belonging inside the community. Um, So thank you for doing that in advance. I will, if you go over to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I'll have this whole episode. I'll have the show notes. I'll have links to all of Jonathan's social media spaces, his book, everything. So you can find everything you want at jenhatmaker.com. Um, you guys just buckle in. This whole series is so good. I, the people on the other side of my screen in this third faith series are, they are top drawer. Like these are some of the smartest, most interesting faith thinkers I've ever spoken to. And so you're not going to want to miss any of these episodes. So by the way, if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, go ahead and do that. And you won't miss any episodes. They just show up in your phone, like little magic. Okay. Um, come back next week, more to come and can't wait to bring you these fascinating conversations. And I hope they serve you and encourage you and lead you well. All right, you guys see you next week.